Uh, a very good morning to all. Uh, this is Dr. Khaled Imran, organizing member of this program. It gives me immense pleasure in welcoming all the participants and today's distinguished speaker, Mr. A. Ramesh, on the second day of one week faculty development program on heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and refrigeration. I hope that yesterday's talk by our respected speaker, Dr. G. B. Krishnappa, was very informative. Today, we have with us a very prolific resource person. Mr. A. Ramesh was born in, uh, on August, in August 1940 in Shiomaga town to late Ananta Swami Rao and Srimati Kamala Bai. He completed all his education in Mysore. After completing BSc and B in Mechanical Engineering, he worked with Tata Electric Companies, Mumbai. Between 1965 and 2000, he worked as a scientist in CSIR, that is Central Food Technological Research Institute, Mysore, and he superannuated as a senior deputy director and head of food engineering department. After retirement, he has been a consultant for many trees and universities. He has completed food engineering courses at Karunya University, Coimbatore, University of Agricultural Sciences, Dharwar, and Davangara University. Mr. Ramesh is presently one of the director of a consultancy firm called Phobix which is active in providing consultancy services to new and existing food and biotech industries. He is an active member of the Indian Society of Heating, Refrigerating and Air Conditioning Engineers. He is also a fellow of professional societies like Institution of Engineers, India, Association of Food Scientists and Technologists. He is happily married to Srimati Madhura Ramesh, a master degree holder in zoology. His children, Harsha Angeri and daughter Vidya Angeri, both engineers and postgraduate degree management diploma holders, uh, are well settled in life, employed well, married, and with children. So today, uh, Sir will speak on refrigeration cycles and classification of refrigeration systems. Thank you very much, Sir. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Am I audible? Hello. Hello. Am I audible? Am I audible? Hello.
Hello. Hello. Ah. Audible idea. Okay. Good morning. Good morning, Herr Sidya. Okay. Good morning. Let me first of all thank uh, Vidya Varjaka Engineering College and uh, Ishre Mysore chapter for giving me a chance to share my thinking on refrigeration cycle and classification of refrigeration systems. This talk will be in two parts. First, I'll be talking about refrigeration cycles. And later on, I'll be talking about classification of refrigeration systems. I hope I am audible. Just to give you an idea of the volume of the industry, uh, this, this slide will give you some information. Domestic refrigeration, 1.5 billion. Commercial refrigeration, 90 million. Then refrigeration transport, 4 million. Air conditioners, 600 million. White water chillers, 2.8 million. Like that. It's a huge industry, so to say. Before uh, we go into the cycles, certain excuse me, please. Hello. Nana Amel Matartini. Iga on the lecture for Okay. 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 See, for example, cooling refers to removal of heat. This is according to ash ray definition. Removal of heat usually resulting in lower temperature or phase change, or simply lowering the temperature. Refrigeration refers to cooling of space, substances, uh, to lower or maintain those lower temperatures below ambient, then or artificial cooling. Chilling refers to cooling any substance like milk or water without freezing it, or freezing refers to cooling for solidification of all the water content in the product. Then cold chain is some, of course somewhat alien to the other four. It refers to a series of action and equipment applied to maintain the product within specified low temperature range for, from harvest to harvest or production to consumption. These are two some small basic things I wanted to tell you. Then before we go into the thermodynamics associated with the processes and charts, I would like you to uh, recollect whatever you have, you know. Uh, for example, heat of vaporization, what we call latent heat also, is the, it refers to the amount of heat required to turn the liquid into gas. The reverse is also possible, gas too. This case, we call it evaporation. The other case, we call it condensation. In HVAC, the change of liquid to gas is known as boiling or evaporation. Conversely, the change is called condensation. A significant amount of energy is required to induce these changes of state, whether it is evaporation or condensation. The whole concept of refrigeration it relies on this fact that a significant amount of energy is required, not just the sensible heat, but the latent heat. So pressure changes the boiling point of the liquid. This is another important concept. Uh, this, is, this comes in our basic gas laws. This is one that is adopted in refrigeration cycles. Lower pressures make it easier for liquid to boil, and higher pressures make it more difficult. So the temperatures also vary. For higher pressures, boiling temperatures will be higher. For lower pressures, boiling temperature will be lower. This is very well made use of in the refrigeration system. This is uh, Newton's first law. Heat energy is neither created nor destroyed. If we take eight ounces of water, 
cup of coffee one at 150 degrees and add another 80 uh, ounces at 50 degrees the temperature will be 100 which is the average so that means it is a simple addition the changes are always linear and it is neither created nor destroyed and then one more thing is you know, cold is never transmitted it is only the heat reverse of heat is cold so there is no such thing as cold only absence of heat because you know the, the temperature absolute zero is minus 293 to 73 and then anything above that it contains heat, it's supposed to be heat, heat content. So whatever we call cold, sub, cold objects, they all contain heat. So there are so many processes that are involved, uh, which, which, which are utilized in the uh, refrigeration cycles. So you should be clear in your mind what, what is what. Adiabatic refers to processes where heat energy is constant. Isenthalpic is enthalpy constant. Isentropic is entropy is constant. Isobaric is pressure constant. Isochoric is volume constant rate. Volume is constant. Isothermal is temperature is constant. Isotropic is direction of flow is constant. Polytropic is where it follows the law P V to the power n equals C. This these are very basic uh, <coughs> types of processes that are involved. So what is adiabatic? Adiabatic is one in which no heat or mass is transferred. Okay, this at a constant heat, no input, no output. Isenthalpic is again almost the same. Isenthalpic is one in which there is no transfer of heat energy to or to the surroundings. And if the systems are surrounded by perfect insulator, there is no change in the temperatures also. Then thermodynamic processes. Isentropic is a, is a process in which entropy remains constant because although entropy concept is a little difficult, constant entropy is very much made use of in all our processes. Isobaric is where the again the pressures are constant. <coughs> Isochloric is one in which volume is held constant, data V is zero. Then isothermal is where temperature is temperature remains constant delta t equals zero. That is when phase changes happen, you know, there may not be any change in the temperatures, like uh, you know, water at saturated water and saturated stream, both are at 100 degrees. So there is this this change is a isothermal change. Isotropic is is a strictly thermodynamic system, however, it may be easily confused with one from the name isotropic systems are uniform regardless of the direction. Polytropic is where the fluid system maintains the relationship of PV to the power of this is basic gas law CPV. <coughs> the refrigerant in the refrigeration system because we refer to a large number of charts. Okay, we refer to a large number of charts and then where, wherein we involve five main properties of the vapor T temperature, H enthalpy. These, these are the notations used that are also not changed, normally kept constant. V for volume, S for entropy, P for pressures. Thermodynamic diagrams or diagrams that are used to represent thermodynamic states of a material or fluid fluids typically. And the consequences of manipulating this material, for instance, a temperature entropy diagram may be used to demonstrate the behavior of the fluid as it is changed by a compressor. So we come across a number of charts, PT charts, PE charts, TS charts and all that. So we should be very much uh, be uh, aware what type of chart we are referring to. <coughs> PH diagram is the simplest that we use mostly in all our refrigeration calculations. Although TS diagrams are also, are also used. So now, refrigeration cycle is popularly called reverse Carnot cycle. Why this is so called and what are the refrigeration cycles? Mainly, we will we'll, 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 uh, uh, refer to the vapor compression refrigeration cycle which is a reverse Carnot cycle. 
why it is so called <coughs> before that this is a curve saturation curve of a any vapor we are interested in refrigerants of course this side is subcooled liquid and this side is super cooled vapor in between is a mixed uh, vapor where we have wet vapors <coughs> so wet vapors of different uh, moisture content and then it gets saturated vapor this shape of the curve height then this when everything depends upon the vapor that we are using so if you are using refrigerant 404 you must use the right type of bell shaped curve you you, you cannot use some other refrigerant curve and do calculations for 404 so we must select the correct one and this is a pressure uh, enthalpy curve or pressure heat curve <coughs> and if i refer to the unit it is btu is given here psia which are uh, yeah, FPS systems of units, somehow no refrigeration still has not changed over fully to SI. So it is convenient for us also to adopt that set of units. So this uh, bell curve can be extended to show many other properties. These are all temperatures and then this, this uh, refers to the pressures and then isentropic curves are shown like this. And the subcooled liquid pressures are shown like this. <coughs> So, in a single curve, many, many parameters can be represented. This is one typical example. So, you know, this is a typical vapor refrigeration uh, cycle. Here, you, you see the shape of the curve. The compression is a constant entropy curve. So, in this entropy curve, it's a vertical, it's a vertical thing. Whereas in a H5, H pressure enthalpy curve, it's a, on a constant entropy. So if you see the shape of the process here, the shape of the process here, they are different. So on, if you get confused with what chart you are using, you will you'll be led to confusion in the other aspects also. So you should remember all this. Now, why we call it a reversed Carnot cycle? In Carnot cycle, we use a high temperature reservoir, maybe maybe a fuel. We burn it in an engine, and then the the cycle of operations happens in the engine, <coughs> and then we release heat to the lower temperature reservoir. There, you know, hot gases coming out of the engine, and we do some work. So your heat input gives you work output. Whereas in a refrigeration cycle, work input gives heat out. It comes towards, towards the condenser. So in the process, it removes heat from the low temperature reservoir. That's why here work is output, is work is input, and heat output here, heat input here. That's why it is called a uh, reverse Carnot cycle. <coughs> so this is the basic Carnot cycle. Although the processor all almost same, you see it goes in the reverse direction. A, B, C, D, A. This is in a, so to say, clockwise direction. Okay. Whereas in a reverse thing, one, two, three, four, this is a refrigeration cycle. <coughs> Here it is in a anti-clockwise direction. The processes are shown in a, so this also the reason why it's called reverse Carnot cycle. Same processes happen in the reverse direction. So you are all aware, yesterday you studied, you have compressors, condensers, expansion walls and evaporators, four main things uh, which, which carry out all these processors, compressing, condensation, so compressor, compressor, condensation, condensation, expansion, expansion and evaporation. So here, this heat extraction here is made use of phenol or air conditioning, coal creation. And then in heat pumps, we make use of the heat coming out of the condenser for other industrial applications. <coughs> so this is a cycle, but uh, let, let's not spend time. We'll go to, we'll watch a small video. Okay. This is delivered by 
Professor Al Palpal Singh is a distinguished professor and emeritus uh, in food engineering from University of California, Davis. <coughs> he did his uh, agricultural and bioengineering from uh, uh, Punjab Agricultural University, later went to University of Wisconsin, Michigan. And then he's a well known uh, professor in uh, process engineering. I'm sure. To get, to get a better, better understanding of the condition of the refrigerant as it moves through various components of the refrigeration system, let us look at a schematic diagram and also a pH diagram side by side. So we will first draw a schematic of the refrigeration system. Uh, as you know, we have four components, uh, compressor, condenser, expansion valve, and evaporator. And recall the letters E, A, B, C, D uh, that refer to the conditions of the refrigerant as it moves through this system. So now let's draw a pH diagram. We have the x-axis and the y-axis. Remember that pressure is shown on the y-axis and enthalpy is shown on the x-axis. We draw a bell-shaped curve, again, skewed to the right. And now we will draw an ideal refrigeration cycle on this diagram. Uh, we will first draw a horizontal line uh, originating somewhere uh, within this region, uh, going all the way to the right-hand side until it intersects the saturated vapor curve. And then from that point, we will draw a uh, constant entropy curve uh, skewed to the right and draw a horizontal line on the top until it meets the saturated liquid curve and then drop a vertical line. Uh, if it doesn't meet the horizontal line, we will just extend the horizontal line to make sure that it meets uh, this vertical line. And uh, so we have the uh, ideal refrigeration cycle. And we will write down the letters E, A, B, C, and D. Note that from E to A, we have the evaporator. Uh, as you know, as you can see on the schematic, so the same thing in this uh, pressure enthalpy diagram, uh, this is for the evaporator section. Part A to B is for the compressor. And the horizontal line on the top from B to D it represents the condenser. And from D to E, we have the expansion valve. And you can, of course, see these different components also shown on the uh, left-hand side uh, schematic. Note that the refrigerant is moving from E to A, A to B, B to D, and then D to E. So note that at location E, uh, since it is this point is within this bell-shaped curve, uh, and this region represents a mixture of liquid and vapor, so the state of the refrigerant is uh, uh, a mixture of liquid and vapor at location E. As the refrigerant moves through the evaporator, it absorbs heat from the surrounding, and all the liquid turns into vapor. So by the time the refrigerant exits the evaporator, as shown by point A, the condition of the refrigerant is in saturated vapor state, identified by point A being on the saturated vapor curve. Now, in the compressor, the pressure is raised. So you see the increase in pressure going from A to B. And as we note from thermodynamics, that when you take a vapor and you compress it, that process is isentropic. In other words, it's a constant entropy process. That is why we must follow a constant entropy curve in this region. At the exit of the compressor, the vapors are in superheated state. That's why this point B is in the superheated vapor region. Now, from point B to C, as the refrigerant vapors exit the compressor, 
you first remove the superheat. So typically that part of the refrigeration system is called a de-superheater, although it is not shown here in the schematic. But most of the heat from the refrigerant is discharged in the condenser as the refrigerant state turns from vapor to liquid. In other words, it condenses uh, and as the refrigerant vapors condense into liquid state, they discharge heat to the surroundings. So, so by, the by the time the refrigerant, the refrigerant exits the condenser, condenser, it is in a fully saturated liquid state. There is no vapor in it. It's 100% liquid. That's why this point is on the saturated liquid curve. Now, from point D, which is at high pressure, that high pressure liquid then enters the expansion valve. So there is a drop in pressure. So, so pressure, pressure decreases, decreases due to the expansion process, process and uh, that, that process, uh, again, according, according to thermodynamics, is an adiabatic process. Uh, recall that adiabatic means that the enthalpy remains constant. That is why we have a vertical line, uh, D to E, because that represents that the enthalpy, as you know from the x-axis, the enthalpy remains constant in the expansion process. So at point E then, as it leaves the expansion valve, uh, some of the refrigerant is in vapor state, but most of it is in liquid state. So that point E represents a mixture of largely liquid, but some vapors in the refrigerant that then enter the evaporator. So this is how the uh, cycle continues. So note that in the evaporator, uh, heat is absorbed from the surroundings and in the condenser, heat is discharged to the surroundings. So uh, this is how a refrigeration system can extract heat from one location and discharge it in another location. If you look at a refrigerator um, where the evaporator is located inside the refrigerator, it absorbs heat from the inside of the refrigerator, so all your food is uh, cooled, and uh, that heat is discharged in the condenser, which quite often is located either in the back of the refrigerator or at the bottom of the refrigerator. So sometimes if you stand next to a refrigerator, you may feel some warm air coming from the bottom of the refrigerator, and that is where the heat is being discharged. Uh, since, since the, the condenser, condenser is uh, located uh, at the bottom. From this uh, refrigeration cycle, there are three important values that we must obtain so that we can solve problems related to either the design or performance evaluation of a refrigeration system. Those values are for the enthalpy, and those are H1, which represent the enthalpy value for either location D or E, uh, since both of them are going to be the same, that is part of a vertical line. And then the enthalpy at lo location A, uh, that is enthalpy H2, and then enthalpy at location B, which is enthalpy H3. Uh, those three values, H1, H2, H3, uh, if we can obtain those from a pressure enthalpy diagram, uh, then we will be able to solve these problems. Uh, we will see in following modules how we can get those numbers that we need for our computations. I hope it was helpful. And uh, we'll continue with our... Uh... Uh, discussion. So there is a very important factor called coefficient of performance in all this because you know in, in any machine work input here and what is the heat output that is that is calculated and then this if you if you analyze the curve that he showed uh, in the last uh, video <coughs> graphically you will be able to determine all these quantities heat at different points. There he used the word 
H1, H2, and all that. Here they are used Q. So you can work out the uh, coefficient of performance. Coefficient of performance for uh, uh, refrigeration systems are anywhere around four to six, depending upon the uh, refrigerant used and the type of uh, system it is. So if you see one more uh, of uh, his uh, talk, we'll see how the COP is calculated in a numerical example. In this, in this uh, uh, numerical, numerical example, example, we will look, we will look at a vapor, vapor depression, depression refrigeration, refrigeration system, system, an ideal, ideal case. case. So, so we have, have a refrigeration, refrigeration system using R134A refrigerant uh, to keep a storage room under some desired cold temperature. At uh, steady state uh, conditions, the evaporator temperature is uh, 0 degrees Celsius and the condenser temperature is uh, 45 degrees Celsius. The cooling load on the refrigeration system is uh, 10 tons of refrigeration. Uh, we have to calculate the uh, refrigerant flow rate, uh, the compressor power, uh, if the compressor efficiency is 80%, and the coefficient of performance. So, so given, given uh, items are the evaporator, evaporator temperature of uh, 0 degrees Celsius, Celsius, condenser temperature of 45 degrees Celsius, Celsius the refrigeration load of uh, 10 tons, and the compressor efficiency of 80%. So we are going to use the uh, pressure enthalpy charts to first obtain the values for H1, H2, and H3. So, so as, as a, a reminder of what you saw in a previous tutorial, uh, we will uh, quickly draw a pressure enthalpy sketch where we have the refrigeration cycle drawn uh, for an ideal case. Uh, we will label these as E, A, B, C, D. And we will note that there are three enthalpies that are important. Uh, that we need for our calculations, H1, H2, and H3. And now we will use the charts for refrigerant 134A uh, to obtain these values of the three enthalpies. So here we have our pressure enthalpy chart for R134A. And also, and also uh, for, uh, for our reference, reference uh, we, have the, we have the sketch on the right hand side. side. We will, we will use a slightly, a slightly expanded, expanded version of this chart, of this chart so, we so we can read the numbers a little better. A little better. So first we, so first identify, we identify the evaporator, the evaporator temperature, temperature line, line, and that, and that, we, know that we know that the evaporator, the evaporator uh, temperature, uh, temperature is 0, zero degrees Celsius. Celsius. So, so identify, identify 0 degrees on both on the left-hand left side curve and the right-hand right side curve, curve the saturated liquid and saturated vapor curves. And then, and then we draw, draw a horizontal, horizontal line. line. And, and next, we identify, identify the condenser temperature of 45 degrees C, again, both, both on the left, left and right-hand right hand side of the uh, uh, bell-shaped curve. curve. And, and draw a horizontal line. line. And, and then, then next, from where the condenser line meets the saturated liquid curve on the top, which will be the location, location D, we drop a vertical line until it meets the line for the evaporator to identify point E. And then on the right-hand side, where we have the saturated vapor curve, so there we draw the line A to B, and that is in the superheated vapor zone. So we must follow one of the constant entropy curves that originate at point A and then meet the condenser line on the top to identify point B. So we have the cycle then drawn on the refrigerant chart. Next, we can go ahead and read the values for H1, H2, and H3 and we find those values as H1 equals 164 
kilojoules per kilogram, H2 of 299, and H3 of 328 kilojoules per kilogram. So from the pressure enthalpy charts, we obtained the values of H1, H2, and H3 as shown here. So in the second step, we will calculate the refrigerant mass flow rate, but we also first note that one ton of refrigeration is uh, equal to 303,852 kilojoules per 24 hours. So the mass flow rate from uh, in a mathematical expression we saw before in another tutorial is uh, the cooling load divided by uh, H2 minus H1. So the cooling load in this case is uh, 10 tons into 303,852 kilojoules per ton, and that is for 24 hours. So we convert 24 hours into seconds uh, by multiplying with 3,600 seconds per hour uh, times the uh, H2 minus H1, and that is 299 minus 164. Uh, kilojoules per kilogram. We will note that most of the units will cancel out, except we will be left with kilograms per second, and we get the mass flow rate as 0 0.26 kilograms per second. The uh, compressor power uh, formula is uh, M dot, which is the mass flow rate, times H3 minus H2, if it was 100% efficient. So, so let's calculate, calculate that, that first. first. Mass, mass flow rate we just found as 0 0.26 kilograms per second and uh, multiplied with the values for H3 and H2, and those are 328 minus 299 kilojoules per kilogram. Uh, so we get 7.54 kilojoules per second if the compressor was running at 100% efficiency. Uh, but, but we, we know, know that, that it is at 80% efficiency, so we will need to divide our compressor power that we just calculated by 0 0.8. So 7.54 divided by 0 0.8 gives us 9.43 kilojoules per second, which is same as 9.43 kilowatts. Now, the coefficient of performance um, is calculated with, a, uh, with an expression that we saw before in another tutorial, H2 minus H1 divided by H3 minus H2. So the enthalpy values here are 299 minus 164 uh, kilojoules per kilogram in the numerator, and 328 minus 299 kilojoules per kilogram in the denominator. So we calculate that coefficient of performance is 4.66. Uh, note that the coefficient of performance for uh, vapor compression systems uh, usually varies between 4 and 6, so uh, our value of 4.66 uh, makes sense. So in this uh, example, we saw how to determine uh, the enthalpy, enthalpy values, values from, from the pressure, pressure enthalpy, enthalpy charts, charts and, and then use those values to uh, calculate the refrigerant flow rate, uh, the compressor power, as well as the coefficient of performance of the refrigeration system. So, in this uh, tutorial, we learned how to calculate the coefficient of performance and mass flow rate of the refrigerant. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop uh, the refrigerant cycle there because there is a lot to learn and uh, in a limited time of uh, for one hour or so, it's very difficult to learn everything. So I leave it at, at that point. So we'll go to classification of refrigeration systems, second part of our lecture. So the, there are a large number of uh, refrigeration systems, natural cooling, art of ice making by nocturnal cooling, night, night cooling that is, then evaporative cooling, <coughs> cooling by salt solutions. In artificial refrigeration, we have vapor compression, vapor absorption, solar energy based uh, refrigeration systems, 
gas cycles, steam jet refrigeration, thermoelectric refrigeration systems. Of course, all, all these uh, have specific applications, I should say, whereas these are all for a general application. Everywhere it is formed. Okay. So natural cooling in, in earlier days, refrigeration was achieved by natural means, such as the use of ice or evaporative cooling in earlier times. It was either transported from colder regions, ice from colder regions was transported to hotter regions <coughs> in insulated containers and then uh, used for all cooling applications. This is uh, what we call natural cooling, which is now more or less given up or still it is used here and there. <coughs> so the, we, we practice a sort of an art for making ice in not, na, natural cooling. The night temperatures, especially in certain regions, go very low, very low. And then if you leave a thin layer of water for a long time, the temperatures can go as low as minus 55 and then it becomes ice and it is insulated with uh, some sort of a hay or whatever it is. And then that, that is made use of. Of course, these, these practices were there. They are classical. Uh, they are not in vogue right now, let's sort of say. Then evaporative condensed cooling, I'll come to that a little later. We will study it in a little day later. That is, whenever anything evaporates, it needs heat, latent heat it needs. It takes from its surroundings. This is what we call evaporative cooling. Because for it to evaporate, it needs heat. Heat it takes from the neighboring. Then salt solutions. So the, the you know, uh, solu solubility of salts in water depends upon the temperature, making use of that properties. So you can, you can use it for uh, cooling the water or cooling the solvent. That's uh, what's what we call cooling by this is again not practiced these days. Vapor compression cycle we have studied in detail. The other, other one is a vapor absorption cycle. Uh, rather than my explaining, I will go to a, a students in this lecture we will learn that how vapor absorption cycle works i will especially talk about the aqua ammonia system okay aqua ammonia system the vapor absorption cycle based on aqua ammonia system okay so i will like to tell you that vapor absorption cycle is a sort of refrigeration cycle in which there is no need of compression okay i believe that you all know that how vapor compression cycle works but, but still, still, I would like to refresh you for the same, that is vapor compression cycle. Vapor compression cycle consists of four main components. Those are the compressor, the condenser, the expansion valve, and the evaporator. So, so what is the job of compression? It compresses the refrigerant. Okay. Okay. Over here, suppose ammonia is used as a refrigerant. So this compressor compresses the refrigerant and sends to the condenser. In the condenser, the ammonia loses its latency to the atmosphere and becomes liquid. Okay. When the ammonia comes out, the refrigerant comes out and reaches the condenser, it is in vapor phase. But when it passes through the condenser, ultimately it becomes liquid by losing the latent heat of vaporization. Ultimately, this compressed refrigerant is passed through the expansion valve, the pressure again reduces and the ammonia reaches the evaporator. In the evaporator, what happens? It absorbs the latent heat of vaporization and again becomes vapor. Okay. It is entering the vaporator in liquid form and ultimately coming out in vapor form. So what happens? Since it, it is absorbing latent heat of evaporation, so this evaporator region cools. So this is the place where actual cooling action takes place. Now this vapor, ammonia or refrigerant goes to the compression bag and again the compressor compresses the refrigerant, sends to the condenser, the refrigerant rejects the latent heat, the refrigerant then passes to the expansion valve, which is the evaporator, here it absorbs the latent heat, again becomes vapor. Like this way the vapor compression cycle works. Okay. In vapor absorption cycle what happens? That the job of this compressor is eliminated. I am talking about the aqua ammonia system. Okay. Aqua ammonia type of vapor absorption system. So how the job of this compressor is eliminated? I am going to tell. See, ammonia has a property that in case 
ammonia is mixed with cold water it is readily soluble means the affinity of ammonia to dissolve in water when the water is cold is high it is highly soluble in cold water okay so over here i am showing a vessel in which there is cold water and ammonia pass is taking place so ammonia is ultimately mixing up with this water so this mixture is called as aqua ammonia solution the ammonia mixed in cold water now in case aqua ammonia solution is heated by the help of supplying heat in case aqua ammonia system is heated the ammonia is again liberated with high pressure over here you can see that this is the vessel inside which the aqua ammonia system is there and we are providing heat So, so ammonia, ammonia is separated, separated from the liquid water and collecting, collecting over, over the top with high pressure. In vapor compression, compression cycle, what is the job of compression? It takes the reagent inside with low pressure at suction pressure and ultimately delivers with high pressure. Okay. So over here, what I told you that in case ammonia is mixed with cold water, then it is highly soluble with cold water. And in case aqua ammonia solution is heated, the ammonia is liberated from water with high pressure over the top. Okay. Now here. What I am doing, you can see from the vapor compression cycle, the compression part is removed. Okay, here the vapor compression is there is the compression, but here I have removed the compression. Now what I am doing, this is the entire vapor absorption system, aqua ammonia based. Okay, instead of compression, there is a generator absorber system. You can see generator absorber system. In the absorber, what is happening? See, ammonia is coming from the evaporator, ultimately coming out from the evaporator. So, so this ammonia is mixed in the absorber. In the absorber, absorber what is there? Cold water, water is there. So ammonia so is highly soluble in cold water. You can see it is mixing in absorber. By the help of a pump, aqua ammonia system. Okay. Over here, since ammonia is dissolved in water, it is called a strong solution. Okay. Now this aqua ammonia solution, by the help of pump, is sent to a generator. Okay. In the generator, what happens? Heat is supplied. So in cold water, ammonia is soluble, but when Heat is supplied in the generator. The ammonia is liberated from the cold water and collects over the top of this liquid water with high pressure. Okay. Now, what is the job of compression? The job of compression is to compress the ammonia. In case we are using ammonia as a refrigerant, taking the ammonia with low pressure and delivering it with high pressure. So over here, the job has been accomplished. That in cold water, ammonia is soluble, and when it is sent to the generator, over here heat is given, so ammonia is liberated and collects over the top with high pressure. This high pressure ammonia is sent to the condenser. Here, it liberates the heat and ultimately comes out in liquid form. Okay. Condensed ammonia, ammonia comes out, ultimately passes through the expansion wall, and, and then passes through the evaporator. Over here, it absorbs the heat. Okay. And becomes a vapor bag. This vapor is again going to this absorber, again mixing with cold water. By the help of pump, sent to the generator. Over here, it is liberated. Okay. Like this way, the cycle completes. Now, what happens? By the help of the pump, this aqua ammonia solution is sent to this generator. So, in this absorber, ammonia is absorbed in liquid water. So, it is called a strong solution. When this strong solution is sent to the generator, over here heat is added, so ammonia is liberated. So, this solution is called as weak solution because less amount of ammonia is now in dissolved form with this liquid water. This comes back to this absorber by the help of a return duct. So, here this is a cyclic process happening. in this generator and absorber system okay so by this way the job of compressor is eliminated because high pressure ammonia is developed by the help of application of heat only okay this is an indicative diagram of our absorber cycle there are many more components also added for improving the performance and the efficiency of this cycle but you would have understood what is the vapor absorber cycle aqua ammonia system based now one more thing that to keep this absorber water cool a coolant pass is given it is acting as a heat exchanger means a coolant is supplied to this absorber by the help of this duct a sort of heat exchanger arrangement so it takes away the amount of heat so that this water remains in cool temperature okay now, now this type of refrigeration system is used where generally this type of refrigeration system is used in industries where waste heat is available because the job of compression is totally eliminated by the help of action of heat itself we are developing the refrigeration effect in the evaporator okay so in case in any industry there is a spare amount of heat available means this the heat which we have to lose in the environment so by the help of that heat itself we can develop the refrigeration effect as well as in case we want to develop a solar refrigeration system then also this type of refrigeration system is helpful because in that case what happens this absorber is kept in some cold area and this generator is kept in sunny area means where sunlight is available 
either direct sunlight as well or by the help of concentrating arrangement more amount of sunlight is focused to the generator so that uh, the action can take place that is the liberation of ammonia from this liquid water and this absorber is kept cool by the help of coolant pass like this you might be thinking that however we have removed the compressor but here pump is there okay and pumps require electrical energy same like that of compressor the pump also requires electrical energy, energy for, for its operation, its operation. but, but the, the amount, amount of electrical energy required, required by, by the pump, pump is very less compared to that of compression. Okay, so, so with very less amount of electrical power input, we can, can develop higher, higher amount of refrigeration effect. effect. Okay. okay, in, in case, case we are using the compressor, that, that is in paper compression cycle, we use the compressor, the amount, the amount of power required, required by this compressor is quite high compared to that of we are using only a pump with, with this generator absorber system and, and for working of this vapor absorption cycle. So, so hope you would have understood the working of vapor absorption cycle, the aqua ammonia based vapor absorption cycle. Thank you. So I have made use of uh, these uh, three uh, videos because you know they I like their way of explanation and then it uh, makes it very simple for us. And then here, of course, we have a we have vapor absorption system. Like he explained, we have an absorber, we have a generator, and then we have the evaporator and condenser and uh, all that, which we uh, which are repetitions from the vapor absorption cycles. So this is again the same thing. Here, you know, main input for a vapor absorption system is the heat. So heat can be from waste heat, as he mentioned. It can be from a solar system. So these are, these can be worked with solar power. So that's why they are very popular. Wherever you have solar power, plenty of solar power is available, provided you make the absorption and all that. And then that can be used for heating the ammonia liquor and to create the high pressure uh, ammonia vapors. So this can be worked with in a solar system where the generator part is heated with the solar energy instead of giving any other type of heat energy, okay. So air cycles, the, the main difference between air cycle and the other vapor cycle is, you know, there is no change of pace in air cycles. So this is mostly used in uh, a, aircrafts and ships, okay. So working fluid is a fixed mass of air that behaves like an ideal gas. The cycle is assumed to be closed loop cycle. <coughs> Although air can be let out, but it is used, it is still made use of because some heat remains in that. We don't want to lose that energy. Open loop cycles are being replaced by heat transfer processes to and from the environment. So we'll be heating the environment. We also avoid that also. And the, all the processes within the cycle are reversible. Either it is heat, heating, compression, expansion, cooling, <coughs> all are uh, reversible cycles. And mostly we make use of the specific heat of air, which almost remains same throughout the cycle. So this shows a cycle. And then we have a compressor, we have an expander, and then we have the heat exchangers. Like instead of, instead of an expansion valve, we have a turbine-like thing, which will allow it to expand. <coughs> and then we have the compressor. You know, you, you, have all, you are all mechanical engineers, you know that turbines and compressor, especially centrifugal compressors and the turbines, their work is similar and reverse. And then these are heat exchangers. Okay, this is, this is called a Brighton circle in which uh, this is a reverse type of Brighton circle, wherein <coughs> no phase change is involved. So this is a very important cycle, frequently employed in gas cycle refrigeration. So I want to stress here <coughs> that there is no change of space. That means uh, the vapor turning into liquid, liquid turning into vapor, that sort of uh, things is not there. And then <coughs> there are just, just one minute. Hello. Ilvala, Illa. I'll call you later, maybe. Oda, Illa. Okay.
there are uh, like like any other cycle there are four cycles <coughs> complete to com four processor completing the cycle adiabatic isobaric that's constant pressure again adiabatic and isobaric two isobaric uh, processes and two adiabatic processes so this uh, explains to you the in, on a ts diagram that is uh, temperature and entropy diagram so we will one, one watch one more last uh, video which will explain this this particular operation in a very simple manner students in this lecture we will learn about the gas cycle refrigeration system okay gas cycle refrigeration system is the one in which air is used as a refrigerant okay particular thing about this type of refrigeration cycle is there is no phase change of the refrigerant in the entire cycle uh, unlike that of the vapor compression cycle in which there is phase change of refrigerant it condenser it converts into liquid the refrigerant passes through the condenser and converts into liquid and when the same refrigerant passes through the evaporator it again changes to vapor but in case of gas cycle refrigeration system there is no as such phase change takes place with the refrigerant air itself however we can use any gas but generally air is used as a refrigerant so air itself works as a refrigerant in case of gas cycle refrigeration system okay and there is no as such phase change of air in the entire cyclic process this type of refrigeration system works on ideally works on thermodynamic cycle that is called as reverse Brayton cycle okay a gas turbine runs on Brayton cycle but the gas cycle refrigeration system works on reverse Brayton cycle okay to understand this thing i have a good example with me you can see over here in this picture there is a piston cylinder system this is the cylinder okay in which there is a piston fitted which can slide inside the cylinder and inside this piston cylinder system, there is some air with it. Okay. And the walls of this cylinder are conducting, means heat can go inside and outside through this system. Okay. And surrounding temperature is 40 degree centigrade. Means this experiment is done in the surrounding where the temperature is 40 degree centigrade. Okay. So initially, this system is in thermal equilibrium with the surrounding. So inside temperature is also 40 degree centigrade. And suppose the initial energy content of air inside this cylinder is 100 joules. That is the internal energy of air. Okay. So once again, this is the piston cylinder system, which contains some amount of air in it. Okay. And the air content has the internal energy with it. That is equal to 100 joules. And the temperature of air initially is 40 degree centigrade, which is in equilibrium with the surrounding temperature. Okay. Now these values, these magnitudes, numerical values, I have took as fictitious values just to make you understand these are not the correct values for air just to make you understand i am taking these numerical values okay now the air content is there inside the cylinder suppose this piston is forced to compress this gas adiabatically adiabatic compression takes place okay so what will happen in case this gas is adiabatically compressed by the help of work done over it what will happen the temperature of air will rise because we know this thing that in adiabatic compression always temperature rises okay suppose the amount of work which is input for this case is 100 joules okay so 100 joule work is invested in air so initially it was having 100 joules of energy now 100 joules more are added in form of Wagner so now the net energy content internal energy content with the air is 200 joules okay and suppose by this compression adiabatic compression the temperature rises to 150 degree centigrade suppose Okay. okay. Now, now we know this thing that the walls of the cylinder are conducting means heat can go in and out. Since the inside temperature is greater than the outside surrounding temperature, so what will happen? Heat will start going out of the system. Okay. Now allow the heat to go out of the system. You can see in this third picture that heat is coming out of the system. Okay. And we know this thing that heat always transfers from high temperature to low temperature until the both systems becomes in thermal equilibrium. Okay. So heat will start coming out of the system and heat will come out and go to the surrounding until unless the inside temperature equalizes the surrounding temperature okay suppose ultimately 
this compressed air attains a temperature of 40 degrees centigrade and becomes in thermal equilibrium with the surrounding okay and in this case suppose 100 joules of heat energy is removed okay because heat is going out of the system suppose the amount of heat which has been rejected by this system is 100 joules okay so total 100 joules of energy heat energy is gone out of this system okay now the air's temperature this compressed air temperature again attains the temperature of that of surrounding air now what happens this air is again adiabatically expanded in this third case the air's temperature was 40 degrees centigrade now, now it is adiabatically expanded what will happen since the adiabatic expansion always temperature decreases so now its temperature will fall below 40 degrees centigrade suppose it is 10 degrees centigrade got it okay Air is adiabatic expanding, it is working against some load. Okay, because the adiabatic expansion work is done by the system. So, what will happen? Since in adiabatic expansion, the temperature drops, therefore, the final temperature will be smaller than the initial temperature. So, initial temperature was 40 degrees centigrade, final temperature will be 10 degrees centigrade. And suppose the final energy content of air is 25 joules. Okay, now this air is cool. This coolness can be used for developing refrigeration effect somewhere to meet some load. This is what the principle of gas cycle refrigeration system. Once again, air was there with normal temperature equal to that of surrounding. It is adiabatically compressed due to adiabatic compression. What happened? The temperature has been raised. Okay, you can see 150 degrees centigrade. So, in case inside temperature is greater than surrounding temperature and the walls of the cylinder are conducting, so heat will start going out of the system up to the time the inside temperature equalizes the surrounding temperature. Okay, so the compressed air inside again attains the temperature of surrounding temperature. Now, in this case, if this compressed air is expanded adiabatically, we know this thing in adiabatic expansion temperature drops, so therefore temperature drops and this air cools down this coolness this cool air can be used for developing refrigeration effect somewhere this is what the principle of gas cycle refrigeration system now coming to the topic a gas cycle refrigeration system consists of four main components those are the compressor okay for adiabatic compression and there is a heat exchanger called as hot heat exchanger okay then there is a turbine where adiabatic expansion takes place and there is another heat exchanger cold heat exchanger which is connected to the system where refrigeration effect has to be developed. Okay, now one by one I am telling you. Suppose the air is compressed in the compressor and temperature hikes. Okay, so it comes out with temperature, high temperature T1. So this is adiabatic compression. So in adiabatic compression, you know this thing, temperature rises, so temperature has been raised. Okay, this you can equalize it with this process. The second one, the air is compressed. Similarly, in the compressor, air is compressed. Now it is passed through a heat exchanger. Okay. This heat exchanger is open to the surrounding, means heat can go out from this heat exchanger to the surrounding. Okay. So when this air will pass through this heat exchanger, its temperature will fall. This is process third, this one. The heat is allowed to escape out of the system. Okay. So air is compressed, high temperature air is coming out. It is passed through the hot heat exchanger. So it loses the heat to the surrounding. Ultimately, when this air comes out, it is expanded in the turbine and adiabatic expansion takes place. Okay. So what happens in adiabatic expansion, the temperature drops. Okay, okay, then, then the, the heat, heat has been rejected, rejected and, and the compressed air temperature, temperature falls, then it is adiabatically expanded. Same thing over here that after cooling, this air is expanded in the turbine, so temperature falls to even lower level. Now you can see over here ultimately the air's temperature is lower. The volume of air is same, means you can see that the volume attained in both the cases are same, but, but here it is a 40 degree, here it is a 10 degree. So this cool air can be sent to a heat exchanger. Which, which is used, used for developing refrigeration effect. effect. Suppose this is a room. Okay. This, this is a heat exchanger which is passing through the room. room. So, what will happen since this air is cool? So, heat of this room will be absorbed by this air. Now, again, it is going back to this compressor. Again, it is compressed. Heat is lost to the surrounding by this hot heat exchanger. Again, it is adiabatically expanded. And then this cool air is again passed through the heat exchanger for developing the refrigeration effect. Okay. This is how the gas cycle refrigeration system works. One more thing that this compressor runs by the help of shaft okay so what happens whatever work is delivered by the turbine is supplied to this compressor back so what happens when the adiabatic expansion takes place in the turbine then the amount of work developed is supplied back to this compressor okay so by this way practically a portion of amount of work is received back by this turbine for its operation because in compressor we have to work in food by turbine we get work done okay this is how the gas cycle refrigeration system work. Now, what are the advantages of gas cycle refrigeration system? First thing, that since there is no phase change process in this cycle, means air remains in gaseous form always. Okay. okay. 
therefore it can attain very low temperature means in case you want to develop an atmospheric effect then the temperature could be as low as minus 150 degree centigrade okay second thing is since air is used as a refrigerant therefore it is lightweight and suitable for aircraft refrigeration because in aircraft what we want least amount of load must be there least amount of weight must be carried with the aircraft since it's for vapor compression cycle the weight of the system becomes high but in this case the weight is light therefore it is very much suitable for aircraft refrigeration system and main disadvantage is that cop of such kind of refrigeration system that is coefficient of performance coefficient of performance for the case of this gas cycle refrigeration system is very less compared to that of vapor compression cycle So hope, hope you would, would have understood, understood the concept of gas cycle refrigeration system. Thank you. So, uh, Mr. Mandal has explained the gas refrigeration cycle in a very simple manner, <coughs> and he has also told that the COP value is very low. That is one main disadvantage in this. It is a uh, that's one one disadvantage. Okay. But they are they are popular. They are used very much in all aircrafts, and then most of the ships, small ships especially, they are using. Uh, otherwise, they go for ammonia and the other uh, vapor compression systems. But most of the aircrafts use uh, air air refrigeration. So this is uh, again vapor absorption, which we have studied. We don't go into that. So we'll go to evaporative cooling, as I mentioned to you know. Uh, before under before going to evaporation it calls for the good knowledge of psychrometrics or properties of moisture one should be very familiar with that so air water with mixtures atmospheric air is a binary mixture of dry air with water vapor and air is a mixture in it is treated as a pure substance even though it may really carry some other mixtures like carbon dioxide and other things <coughs> applications are heating ventilating and air conditioning okay the pressures are very low and then ideal gas law can be used both for air and water vapor so but uh, one should one should be familiar with uh, some of these things on mole fraction ratio humidity ratio then relative humidity dew point temperature and all that mean in order to thoroughly understand this evaporative cooling system <coughs> although it is very difficult to deal with each one of them in detail In this particular lecture, we'll just see what what it is. Dry bulb temperature refers to the temperature determined by an ordinary thermometer. Wet bulb reflects the cooling effect of the evaporating water. This effect is often used to cool livestock buildings, etc. Wet bulb temperature determines the humidity of the uh, atmosphere. Dew point temperature is the temperature at which all the moisture in the contained in the air. Gets condensed. <coughs> relative humidity, as the name implies, relative humidity is a measure of how much moisture is present as compared to how much moisture we can hold. <coughs> That is uh, absolute humidity divided by the saturation humidity. And then you are all familiar with psychrometric chart. This uh, this is a graphical uh, statement of pressure and uh, uh, temperature, but it shows. All all the properties relating to air, <coughs> very different curves, but it's, a, it's always a crowded uh, curve. So one will have to be very familiar with the psychrometric chart in order to understand air conditioning as well as evaporative cooling. So theory of evaporative cooling is you now evaporative evaporation needs heat. This if you uh, if you make the water to evaporate, it needs latent heat. That latent heat it takes from the surrounding, so surrounding air it cools air, surrounding water it cools water, whatever it is. <coughs> so here is a simple direct evaporative cooling in which you have you have a container, let us say, packed with some uh, packings, and then water is made to flow down in that, and then air is passed through that. as the air passes through the water surfaces it uh, comes in intimate contact with the water that is dripping down and then that water evaporates <coughs> and then what whatever comes out will be at a high high in a cooled state 
temperature will be lower. Okay, this is the basic theory of uh, so it draws water is to be recirculated again, of course. Then there is uh, if you if the, if it comes uh, see here air comes directly in contact with the water. So what happens? It carries all those some of the evaporated water. So the humidity increases. So it may not be advisable. Many times it will not be advisable. So we use uh, what's water called <coughs> indirect evaporative cooling. The same thing happens, but the water. The heat exchange between the air and the water takes place through a heat exchanger tube. So that the moisture in, is not carried along with the air, so that your uh, cooled air will be dry again. It will, it will, so humidity will not change as it passes through the cooler. So this is a tubular heat exchanger. There are different types of heat exchangers are used. Uh, so these are all the tubular heat exchangers. Air passes through the the tubes, whereas outside the water is, is dripping through, and then there is a pump for recirculating. <coughs> so these are all the tube uh, plate type. Uh, you you sometimes plate type of evaporative cooling is used. The heat exchangers can be tubular heat exchangers or plate type heat exchangers. You know, you have two types, two main types of. Uh, heat exchangers. Here, in this particular machine, tubular heat exchanger is used. That is, you want indirect evaporative cooling. That is, air and water should not come in contact with each other, but the cooling must take place. So, this is another type, a mixed type, whereas initially it is indirect cooling. Later on, it is direct cooling, so that some amount of moisture is picked up it is not as much as in a totally direct type of thing. So this same cycle is marked in a psychrometric chart here. <coughs> so these are the different types of uh, evaporative coolers. So one, one major application in the refrigeration system is even in vapor compression ammonia systems especially, <coughs> you want rapid cooling in the condenser, rapid cooling of the refrigerant in the condenser. So instead of using the normal uh, shell and tube type of heat exchangers for the condenser, you make use of evaporative cooling. So cool it, cool it with uh, evaporative cooling so that rapid cooling can take place. So steam jet is, you know, you create vacuum in inside a vessel using a steam jet air ejector. So as you change the, you know, uh, pressure, vapor pressure inside a chamber, the temperatures can be changed. You know, the, the pressure and temperature are directly related. So you use a thermo compressor operated by steam. So because of this, the, you create a lower pressure here, which, which will lower the temperature. So this is the steam jet refrigeration, where, wherever you have a lot of steam. You can measure, make use of this is again directly water heating. <coughs> so if the pressure is reduced, water boils at low temperatures. If you bring it very to very low, even at uh, atmospheric uh, temperature, water starts boiling. And then that's when it boils, it goes out. The it requires latent heat it takes from the surrounding water, so the water gets cooled. So reduce pressure by throttling the steam through nozzles. So this vacuum is created by the steam jet air ejectors. Okay. So these are some of the calculations that are shown. We'll not go into that. So evaporating one kg of water by lowering the pressure lessens the temperature of the remaining water by 5.7 degrees. This is a thumb rule calculation. <coughs> and then by reducing it further, you can lower the temperatures through any desired level. So this is the, you are all familiar with, uh, and this is a steam jet ejector for creating a vacuum. So you have a high pressure uh, steam coming in and as it goes through a nozzle, there is an area called vena contractor where low pressures are developed and then it sucks 
the air from the from wherever it is connected to from a required space and then it expands and goes out so this is uh, in brief the theory of steam jet uh, cooling systems and then of course cryogenic is one of the major areas of cooling ultra low temperatures i don't intend to go into this because you know there is a full time lecture by dr kasturi rangan in this course itself so i leave it to him to explain everything so i will not go into that but one thing is this is a <coughs> this is a major area of cooling and refrigeration so thermoelectric is mostly el electronic cooling you know this not used generally <coughs> for uh, uh, cooling of rooms or cooling of food products or pharmaceuticals or anything this is mostly for cooling of electronic components inside the com computers and all that so based on thermo electric effect is a direct conversion of temperature differences to electric voltage and vice versa you know you are all familiar with peltier and peltier thomson effects and all that are uh, based on which thermo couples are created the reverse of that is this <coughs> so these are the major uh, cbec peltier and thomson these are the pioneers in creating this uh, theory that is both thermo couples and thermo electric cooling so by using uh, you know this uh, np insulators between two conductors and then by creating a sort of a voltage you can create heat on one side and then lower lower temperature on another side so by multiplying this uh, np elements you can go to very low temperatures and then if small amount of air is blown over that it can cool your electronic components in all electronic gadgets so here a cold surface And this is the heat dissipated it goes out and then <coughs> this is your dc power supply so this is how cooling takes place this is the simplest tgc or thermoelectric cooling system so using special properties of thermoelectrical couples many pellets can be arranged in rectangular arrays to create practical thermoelectric modules so you can create very high, uh, high very low temperatures required for your electronic applications so it has it, it has, uh, everywhere we have the coefficient of performance there is a way of calculating the cop here also so thermoelectric generators temperature controls in missiles telecommunication equipment space probes cooling of computers some food industry applications so it can't take very heavy loads medical equipment and drinking water cooler and all that there are a lot of applications that are new new applications are also coming out these days so i stop here i thank once again everyone who concerned for the patient hearing thank you very much i am through hello hello Uh, this is the end of the session. I thank you very much for the delivering and a wonderful talk on refrigeration cycles and classification on refrigeration system. The talk was very much uh, informative, resourceful, and uh, explorative, and it has benefited to all. We profusely thank Shri Ramesh for delivering the talk on the refrigeration cycle and classification on refrigeration yeah. system. I thank you one and all who presented over here, sir. Once again, thank you very much for uh, presenting the talk on. Thank you. I thank you one and all for everybody. And tomorrow should be at the same time by eleven o'clock. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you.